Hello, everybody. I am Dr. Duke, and this is another one of our Freedom Project lecture series. This one's a fun one. We're talking about the Peanuts Gang, a promise of Christian redemption. Uh, I don't know if you're like me, but when you were a little kid and you first read Peanuts comic strips or comic books, or you watch the Charlie Brown Christmas, or it's the great pumpkin Charlie Brown, that's a rite of passage for all American kids, I, was, I always remember being a little kid and being struck by the core sadness of the Peanuts story. Uh, very human. There was a lot of defeat. It wasn't superhero comics where good always triumphed. Uh, it wasn't the kind of cartoon violence that you see in things like uh, Bugs Bunny and Roadrunner or uh, the, the Porky Pig cartoons, the Woody Woodpecker cartoons. Uh, well, there was something really poignant and deeply human about Peanuts. Uh, whether you saw them on the printed page or you saw them in their little animated cartoons. And it never left me. Um, I, th th something about hum the human experience there that uh, I thought was really moving. And the older I got, of course, the more I continued to read and watch and uh, began to put two and two together. And I think that one of the things that really most interested me about Peanuts was just how profoundly Christian they were in many ways. Now, we now know in studying the life of Charles Schultz, who was himself raised Lutheran, who uh, became for a while quite evangelical, uh, followed Billy Graham, uh, and ultimately at the end of his life came to reject dogma. He, all his life, Charles Schultz was terribly, terribly suspicious of, of hypocrisy, Christian double dealing. He was suspicious particularly of dogma, uh, exclusionary dogma of many churches, uh, problems incidental to all world religions. But he never did lose sight of the fundamental humanity of Christ, the, the mercy, the virtue. Uh, and in his peak comic book characters, he sort of recreates what it's like to live in a fallen world. You have tremendous heartbreak. Think about Charlie Brown never getting to kiss that red-haired girl or never uh, getting the winning hit in the baseball game or never being able to kick that football. You think about the, the heartbreak that the characters experience in the comic strip. Um, the consequence of people mistreating each other. Uh, Charlie Brown is the victim of, of terrible, terrible comments and insults from some of the other characters, uh, and yet he manages to endure. Uh, you, in, in the comics, the Peanuts comics, you have uh, this, this fallen world misery, but it's also circumscribed with laughter, uh, that over and above the moments of despair and sadness, you have great moments of ecstatic joy, of exuberance, of awe, of wonder, of faith. In, in this regards, and I don't think it's too fine a point, I don't think it's too close a comparison as an English professor, in many ways, the Peanuts comic strip, in my mind, monitors this, uh, mirrors the structure of Dante, the Divine Comedy, or the Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer, where sadness and sorrow and weakness and sin abound, and yet the artist recognizes and circumscribes all of that with laughter and the promise of wonder and the hope of a better world. Who was Charlie Schultz, Charles Sparky Schultz? Born in Minneapolis in 1922, and, and I love, absolutely, as a kid growing up in the Midwest myself, who was accustomed to snow three or four months of the year, just the wonderful artistic ability of Charles Schultz to represent little kids outside, to represent weather and snow and beautiful beech trees and falling autumn leaves, uh, the world, the cosmos as we understand it. So much more of Peanuts took place outdoors than indoors, and I think that's uh, a very telling, moving thing as well. Born in Minneapolis in 1922, he was the only child child of Carl uh, and Dina, Car Carl Schultz and Dina Halverson. Carl Schultz was born in Germany, emigrated to this country, emigrated to this country. Dina was an American and uh, barbers. Uh, he was, uh, owned a bar his own barber shop. Uh, it, even that's kind of uh, touching that he was an only child. Uh, very often only children uh, have to make up their own playfellows. Lonely, uh, single only children uh, become oftentimes become artistic characters uh, because they have to live so much in their imagination and Charles Schultz was no different. He was a lonely, shy boy, and you can see from the pictures there, right? Uh, there's something very Charlie Brown in that round face and that uh, hyper-concerned look. The lonely, a shy child for whom art was clearly an escape. Uh, he remembers very vividly the first recognition Charlie Schultz got for drawing was in kindergarten when he drew a picture for his teacher. Uh, but also a life like the Peanuts gang life, uh, like Charlie Brown's life, a life of uh, tremendous uh, sorrow, struggle, up and downs. Uh, his mother, to me, was deeply devoted. Dina died of cancer in 1943 when he was 21 years old. And within just a very short time afterward, Schultz was drafted and sent to the army. And most cripplingly, 
for the vast majority of time that Dina was sick, his mother, she didn't let him know. Carl never let him knew, know. And so it wasn't until she was terminal, until she was at the point where she could no longer hide it, that young Charlie Schultz found out that his mother was going to die. And within a very short period after her death, he was sent to the army to participate in World War II. Uh, very tough on the developing young man. Uh, but in the army, too, you think about those wonderful cartoons Chuck Schultz drew, drew Charles, Charles Schultz drew, of World War I of Snoopy the Flying Ace. Uh, and war, he, he very seldom ever, if ever, talked much about World War II or wrote about it uh, or drew about it. But certainly World War I the, in a previous generation was something that Snoopy was very big on. And so the whole theme of war does make its appearance. He was a staff sergeant in, in the military, Schultz was, and led, believe it or not, for such a gentle, cal- quiet man, he led a squad of 50 caliber machine gun team, which is pretty remarkable. He does say, though, he got into the war kind of late by the time he made it over to Germany. And he only had one opportunity at which he could fire his weapon at the enemy. And in his words, thank God, uh, the German soldier surrendered voluntarily before he had to shoot him. Uh, and so even though he was over there and saw a lot of carnage, uh, he himself managed to go the entire war without having to kill anybody. And, and you see um, how uh, all of these issues, this trauma, the things, the way he lived his life, the things that happened to him become part of his comic strip. He was raised Lutheran very seriously. His whole life he took certainly Christian ideals incredibly uh, seriously. They permeate the strip throughout, even though, again, as we said before, the older he got, the more suspicious of dogma he became, the more suspicious of those Christians who argued that their way was the only way or that he, that their particular denomination or sect had all the answers uh, over all the other ones. And that really came to bother him. Uh, The older he got, he didn't become disillusioned with Christ. He became disillusioned with organized religion, as so many thinkers had. Uh, But he comes back to it again and again in his themes. After the war, uh, Schultz lived with his father uh, above the family barbershop. Uh, He was nicknamed Sparky by an uncle after the horse spark plug in the old famous Barney Google comic strip. So even his nickname and his uh, early experiences come from reading the comics. Schultz said at one point that on Sunday afternoons there wasn't much to do in the 1930s during the Great Depression uh, in the middle of Minnesota. You think about that too, that besides World War II, uh, besides the death of his mother, he lived as a little boy through the Great Depression. And playing hockey, right, on the frozen, uh, easy enough to do, cheap enough to do on the frozen lakes of Minnesota, all 10,000 of them, uh, uh, playing hockey, reading the comic strips and listening to the radio. You imagine this young boy, lonely young boy, sad young boy, uh, shy, melancholy by dis- demeanor, uh, living in the frozen tundra of Minneapolis, of, of Minnesota, uh, and very much drawn to those radio heroes and radio cartoon programs, radio serials, and then reading the comic strips, right? Little Abner, Barney Google, Pogo, uh, those seminal comic strips that this young boy would read in the paper every day uh, as he drew and drew and drew more himself. Uh, in fact, his first brush with fame, Charles Schultz, came as early as 1937 when he was 14 years old. Uh, as a boy, he had a black and white dog named Spike. In fact, he had a couple of black and white dogs, one that preceded Spike, uh, but a black and white dog named Spike who was a mixed breed, part beagle and part other, uh, but he ate unusual things. This dog was a vacuum cleaner, kind of like a mountain goat. It would eat tacks and it would eat staples and it would ke- eat nails uh, among pretty much anything it get its mouth around. And so unusual was the dog that Sparky Schultz, young Sparky Schultz, drew a picture of the dog and sent it off to Ripley's Believe It or Not. And there is the actual 1937 uh, image from the magazine. You can see the dog there at the bottom center. That's drawn by Sparky, it says. Uh, owned by, drawn by Sparky, and here's the little tag beneath it. A hunting dog that eats pins, tacks, screws, and even razor blades is owned by C.F. Schultz, St. Paul, Minnesota. C.F. was Carl, the father. Uh, Charles Schultz's middle name, Charles M. Schultz, was Monroe. Charles Monroe Schultz. But even at 14 years old, to get a drawing uh, published in Ripley's Believe It or Not magazine with his own little caption, uh, you could see how the percolating was going on in the boy. And many people don't realize that before there was a peanut strip, there was a precursor strip to peanuts, which was called Little Folks. Right, Little Folks. It was the very first strip that he wrote. Uh, and from 1947 to 1950, after he got out of the service, after the war ended, moved back to Minneapolis, lived with his father without their mom, above the barbershop where dad cut hair. In fact, Charlie Brown's character in the comic strip Peanuts was a barber as well. 
And so Little Folks ran from 1947 to 1950, and it was a focus was on little kids, but little kids who actually experienced really adult humor, really adult uh, uh, ideas. Schultz made it clear over the course of his career that he didn't consider this a little kid's strip. He didn't consider it aimed primarily or even mainly for little people, for kids. He, but he thought he recognized really early on, it was a brilliant revelation for him, uh, that you could put serious adult issues in the mouths of little children and you could take that edge off. You could blunt the edge a little bit, particularly in a war-torn world, post-World War II, uh, entering the Cold War where the promise of nuclear Armageddon was upon us, the idea that uh, the world was entering this post-apocalyptic space age. Uh, the, the, the power of putting human experience into the mouths of these charmingly drawn little human kids uh, was, a, was quite a, a way of, uh, I mentioned earlier, this ability to, to keep the core of human suffering and misery, but surround it uh, with joy and sorrow and wonder. And by placing these serious issues, sometimes in the mouths of very little children, Schultz was able to pull off uh, an immense tug on the, uh, the emotional heartstrings. To see adults suffer, as the great uh, existentialist Fyodor Dostoevsky wrote, to see adults suffer was okay. We adults have eaten the apple, so to speak. We've sinned knowingly. And so when we suffer, it is simply the consequence of our behavior. But what about those little kids, right? Over and above the concept of original sin, what about the suffering of children? And how is that mitigated somehow uh, existentially by all of this? In fact, the very first cartoon that Schultz ever drew for little folks, the introductory cartoon, is exactly this kind of a cartoon. You have two little kids, right, sitting on the stoop uh, in... Uh, late 1940s America, when the economy was booming, when the baby boom generation were being conceived. So there were kids everywhere. Uh, suburbia uh, took off, right? Uh, all of these prefabricated houses went up that all looked alike. All these suburban neighborhoods opened up. And there you have two little kids, as was the want, uh, sitting on a stoop. And along comes a little round-headed kid. Well, here comes old Charlie Brown, says the first panel. Good old Charlie Brown, yes sir, good old Charlie Brown, until he's out of earshot, and then, how I hate him, the little boy says. Right. And what a compelling way to enter the world, uh, Schultz's comic strip here. Uh, you know, it seems like a very bucolic suburban uh, uh, a scene, maybe going to play some marbles, the kids will get together. It's very leave it to beaverish in terms of the way it's drawn, uh, with the oversized heads, the round faces. How much expression Schultz was able to get over his career out of these simple squiggle, a squiggled line, a little furrowed brow, right, a, a raised eyebrow or two, a crooked smile from Charlie Brown. Brown, a crooked smile of suffering from Charlie Brown could express so much raw human emotion. So too, a simple dancing, frolicking pose from Snoopy could suggest the opposite of the sadness and sorrow of Charlie Brown. But this opening cartoon, I think it's very important uh, to set the, st the tone for this. This is a melancholy strip, like the man was melancholy. The, but the, ep the episodes of great joy are so much more joyous because they're punctuated by these human moments of insensitivity intolerance, bias, uh, very frustrating. Uh, but off goes Charlie Brown, and the two kids continue their conversation. And we never, know, we never do find out why good old Charlie Brown is disliked. But right from the get-go, right from the very earliest panel, he's good old Charlie Brown, even though here he's clearly about three or four years old. All right, uh, these little kids, little folks, were younger than their Peanuts counterparts would grow up to be eight, nine-year-old kids when it was all said and done. And we move to uh, the sound theology. We mentioned that uh, Charles Schultz was a serious Christian in the sense that he was an intellectual Christian. Uh, he read his Bible. One of the things I love about the Phoenix comic strips, in the same way that I love reading Chaucer's The Canterbury Tales or Dante's Inferno, how terribly literate it is, uh, right? Going back and including all these figures from the past in the Inferno or the Divine Comedy in general, Chaucer's bringing in all this erudition from the ancient world, the Greeks, the Romans, the early Middle Ages, it's all in there. Uh, how literate it was. Schultz was an incredibly literate cartoonist in ways that you couldn't be today, I don't think. You think about um, the kind of comic strips that pass today, things like uh, even really good comic strips like uh, The Far Side, 
which aren't terribly political, and they're not terribly learned. It's all about uh, the ennui of day-to-day life, the the crooked glance at reality that makes it seem absurd. Uh, Or it's political commentary, like um, Mallard Fillmore, for instance, which I really like, or some of the, or Doonesbury on the left, Mallard Fillmore more on the right, Doonesbury on the left, uh, sharply political criticism, social observation, or whimsy is what you get in modern cartoons. Schultz was literate. He was, he had the look of a past and he had the demeanor of a college English professor. And he, uh, those two things are again and again come up in his, his oeuvre, his, his, his output. Penis was all about sound theology, the theology of how do we live Christian lives? How do we live in love? How do we live with each other? Uh, how do we deal with life's anxieties? Anxiety is a huge problem uh, in the Peanuts comic strip, as I'm sure you know, right? Worrying about this, worrying about that, worrying about the little red-haired girl and worrying about having to go out and pitch today and worrying that the rain was going to rain out our baseball game, worrying that Lucy was going to pull that football away again. Everybody worried, uh, except Snoopy towards the end. Uh, Despite moments of great anxiety, Snoopy, of course, uh, becomes lost more and more in fantasy as the strip progresses. He becomes an outlet, uh, an uh, an artistic and uh, uh, intellectual outlet for uh, very often the suffering that goes on with the other characters. Schultz was raised in a Lutheran town by a primarily, uh, raised a Lutheran in a primarily Catholic town, which he talked about a lot. In 1957, Schultz actually saw Billy Graham's Crusade for Souls in New York City and just was sucked in, saw these huge crowds that turned out to see this charismatic young minister. And there are wonderful parallels between Billy Graham and Schultz. Tall, lean, fair-haired men. Both knew how to attract and hold an audience. Both talked about the fundamental humanity at the core of human existence uh, and how much of that fundamental core of human nature was suffering. Uh, The book of Genesis tells us uh, that suffering is the consequence for our own misdeeds, for our own abuse of our free will. Both Billy Graham in his crusade to save souls and Charles Schultz, I think, really was a crusader for souls as well in the sense that he was able to tell the story of humanity, uh, but always taking the blunt edge of suffering off and replacing it with things like awe and wonder and joy. In 1957, Schultz saw Billy Graham was sucked into the crusade and uh, couldn't stop talking about it. For a man that was quite shy and retiring, uh, he he told everybody he could talk to when he got back to Minnesota about this charismatic preacher and how deeply he was uh, um, moved by him. He was motivated primarily by the message of Christ in this. And as I said a couple of times already, Schultz, though, however, was deeply, deeply suspicious of dogma. He despised hypocrisy. Um, and, And like all good thinkers, he was harshest on his own. Uh, We mentioned Dostoevsky. There's a great line of Christian intellectual, C.S. Lewis, who have plenty to say uh, about non-Christian culture and its corruptions and its mistakes and its inhumanity. Uh, But they were also, these great Christian thinkers, really, really attuned uh, to and intolerant of, righteously intolerant of, a bigotry and insensitivity and uh, small-mindedness within the sect of Christianity. Now, that's one of the hallmarks of all of these great writers, and it's particularly Dante, too, and Chaucer, I must add, uh, were also very much the same way. Uh, so, so here, too, you see this great little strip. It's a rainy day, right? And there they are trapped inside, and that itself is a metaphor. I had mentioned that so many of the Peanuts comic strips, I haven't done any kind of an analysis. I'll bet you 70, 80, maybe even 85% of the Peanuts strips, if not more, were situated outside, whether outside of Snoopy's doghouse or outside on the ball field or the football field or on the ice skating rink or in the schoolyard. Again and again and again, the outdoors were so important. Uh, And that's remarkable for a kid living in Minneapolis who would have been trapped inside a lot of the time. And so being in the house, being in the realm of the adults, and you know how wonderful it was that you never actually see the adults in any of his comic strips. You don't see the adults, you don't hear, every now and then you'll hear them, there'll be a bubble speech coming at you, which when the the video, the animated shorts, Peanuts, were made, wah, 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 right? right? You couldn't even hear uh, the, uh, the adults articulate what they were saying. They were so divorced from the experience of the little children. But here they are trapped inside, the rain's coming down uh, like bars on the window, right, to keep them inside. And just how powerful these pen drawings were from Schultz. How much emotion, how much realism. Uh, the window frames, and some, we have wonderful comics of, of Charlie Brown and Linus standing outside on a starlit night as if they're two tiny little creatures in a vast universe. And then you can go to a window frame like this, where the only thing that seems to exist in the whole world are this brother and sister, Lucy and Linus. Boy, look at it. 
Look at it rain, Lucy says. What if it floods the whole world? And Linus responds, it will never do that. In the ninth chapter of Genesis, God promised Noah that he would never, it would never happen again, right? And the sign of this promise is the rainbow. Not only did God, it's biblical, right? We go back to the book of Genesis, we know. We know that these kinds of, this kind of destruction, the world will never be drowned again because God promised that. And the rainbow is God's symbol in the, side to rem, sign, in the sky to remind us of this, right? Lucy says, you've taken a great load off my mind. And Linus responds, sound theology has a way of doing that. That's a wonderful way to phrase it. If your theology is sound, if you know that Christ is the Savior, if you know that you're destined for glory, if you know that the sins of man have been redeemed, well, in the words of our, our own Lord and Savior, we, uh, why are you anxious? Why do you worry about these things, right? Um, over and over again, Christ said that, and that seems to be a message here. There's, some, there's comfort in that. If you know the fundamental tenets of Christianity, then however miserable or rain-bound or unhappy or lovelorn or lacking in Valentines or unable able to kick that football your life may be, you know in the end you're going to laugh. You'll have the last laugh. Sound theology has a way of doing that for us. And I think you could make an argument that, that Charles Schultz's uh, complete works from 1947, Little Folks, to 1950, 1950, till he died in the year 2000, 50 solid years of Peanuts comic strips over and above the little folks, you can make a really good argument that that is sound theology, that as impressive as, in its own way, uh, like Thomas Aquinas or like Martin Luther or like John Wesley or like the great theologians of Western culture for the last 2,000 years, what he's doing here is he's expanding on the Gospels, but he's doing it with pictures. He's doing it in the guise of little children. He's doing it with simple brush strokes and wonderfully wise, short, pithy commentary. This is a Bible commentary that we're getting with Schultz. And it's really quite beautiful because it emphasizes the humanity of God's interaction with men. But he wasn't afraid. I mentioned how he despised hypocrisy. He despised posers. He despised bigots. Uh, he despised those within his own religion who sought to, dis to uh, divide, not unite. Billy Graham was a great uniter. Billy Graham was a, somebody to reach out to people wherever they were in their lives and to offer them hope, to offer them participation in the bigger pageantry that is the Christian narrative that circumscribes pure material reality. And in that world, in that vein, Schultz was not in the least uh, hesitant to satirize, sometimes brutally, uh, a misplaced dogma. In the first of the two comments we, comics we have here on the left, do you ever pray, Lucy? He says to his sister as she jumps rope. And just look at how wonderful the rope drawing is, right? With simply by redoubling the, the line of the rope a few times, it, may, it makes it seem like motion is taking place even in a completely static frame, uh, the frame of the four panel strip. I mean, nobody, I think, has ever done more with a four panel strip than Schultz did in terms of being able to create depth. Uh, the way he draws grass, for instance, just the, the, the t slightly slanted line, his beautiful trees, the open sky. Do you ever pray, Lucy? Linus asks his sister. She drops the rope. That's kind of a personal question, isn't it? Are you trying to start an argument? I suppose you think you're somebody pretty smart, don't you? I suppose you think, and then he cuts it off, dot, 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 because we know uh, Lucy Van Pelt very well, and we know that she's going to go on and on and on about this. And so you cut to the final punch, and in these four panel, that's it. In a four panel strip, you have to lay out a premise, make an argument, and then you have to have that punchline, right? You have to have that payoff in the fourth strip, the fourth panel, and there it is. Uh, there's uh, Linus and Charlie Brown sitting on a stoop, and Linus is sucking his thumb, he's holding his security blanket, and he says, you're right, religion is a very touchy subject, right? And this idea that we've banished religion from the public sphere, we've banished religion from polite conversation. And while there are advantages to that, there are also disadvantages. Uh, the, the vulnerability of Linus's initial question, do you ever pray, Lucy? It's, it's, the, it's the question of somebody who's anxious and unsure, somebody who wants reassurance and community. And Lucy comes right back at him, and she is the great materialist, isn't she? If, Charlie Brown, if, if Snoopy is the fairy tale alternative to the harsh realities of Charlie Brown's existence, well, then Lucy is the bare knuckle brawler. She is the pure materialist, right? Who's in your face about everything and who takes no guff from anybody. 
But she misses this in her brother. That the simple human inquiry, do you pray, Lucy? Do you ever feel the need? Do you ever feel that God might not be there? And she just hammers him with the ACLU version of, of don't talk about this, can't talk about that, no way. His final comment, you're right. Religion is a very touchy subject, right? But should it be? And the next panel, right, taking on the shibboleth issues of the day, uh, this is a much la a larger Sunday panel. And there's Sally, little Sally, little hapless Sally Brown, baby sister of Charlie Brown, wearing, by the way, in the comic strip, the exact same dress that my little Sally doll on the front of the table is wearing, if we flip back to a second. There's Sally wearing exactly the same dress with exactly the same polka dots. But the car cartoon strip, there she is walking, and she sees Charlie Brown, her brother, older brother, watching TV, and she says, guess what? What? And she looks around. She looks around some more, and she s slips into the hallway to look beyond the door, and she, she, in hushed tones, signals for her brother to follow her, and she looks again to make sure no one, and then she looks out the window to make sure no one's paying any attention. Then they crawl behind the couch, at which point she says to him in the payoff panel, we prayed in school today. We prayed in school today. My goodness, can you imagine for a strip like this in the 1970s? Uh, what, six or seven years removed, eight years removed from the uh, removal of prayer in the public schools, how in such short term the possibility of prayer in school has been so beaten down into these little kids. Uh, so this is, the cons this is the flip side of that first cartoon, isn't it? That Linus reaches out to his own sister for a t a, a, some sense of community and prayer, some sense that it's okay. Maybe they have different ways of praying. Maybe Lucy's prayers have been more or less effective and she's radically su shut down by her sister. Who do you think you are asking these questions of me? And meanwhile, little Sally Brown in the next strip, right, who uh, is so uh, bemused by the we could call them the politically correct police, even 50 years ago, how they had so effectively erased prayer from the schools that you have to go through all these beautiful motions. I love the way the TV is drawn. I love the picture on the wall. I love the door frames. I love uh, the plants growing underneath the windowsill. But the money's there. When she puts her little hands on her face, we prayed in school today. What a way to handle from two radically different perspectives, right, the same issue. I titled my next slide, Evangelists and Pragmatists, because uh, he was interested in both. He was a very pragmatic Christian, Schultz was. In a way, Schultz reminds me a lot of C.S. Lewis, who very much considered himself what he called a big C Christian. Right? Uh, he didn't associate with, particularly with any denomination. When he became a Christian, uh, Tolkien had a, a J.R.R. Tolkien and others in the Inklings group at Oxford University uh, had a lot of pull in pulling uh, Lewis away from his materialist atheism and into the fold of Christianity. But Lewis was very hesitant to join a denomination. Tolkien was pushing him to become a Catholic. He became an Anglican simply because it was the religion of England where he was a citizen. But he always considered himself what he called a big C Christian. In other words, he believed the fundamental tenets of Christ and the dogma mattered less to him. It didn't matter to him if your Christianity was packaged in Lutheranism or it was dressed up in Catholicism Catholicism, right, or it was, wa it was boiled down to baptism. Uh, it didn't matter to him. The, the fundamental truths of the incarnation uh, and the, the, the death and resurrection of Christ, those are things that we all as Christians have to believe. And that was where Lewis came down. And I'm absolutely convinced that was Schultz's opinion as well. But for an, there were times in his strip when he was evangelistic, uh, or his characters could be, but there were also times when they were highly pragmatic when it came to issues of faith. And these two cartoons sort of suggest both, both parts of, of Schultz's uh, artistic endeavor here. In the first, we see uh, the two kids, uh, uh, and they're always leaving. I love how many, again, how many panels have kids leaving the inside to go outside to uh, getting out. And here they are walking down the stoop, and there's... Uh, Sally and Linus heading off to school with their, ba with their bags, their ba book bags, their lunch bags. And Sally says to Linus, I would have made a good evangelist. You know that kid who sits behind me at school? I convinced him that my relig religion is better than his religion. How'd you do that? Linus asks. I hit him with my lunchbox. Right? And you see the kind of wry payoff in the fourth panel, satirizing, of course, uh, the, the, the idea that the first true 
um, law of any religion ought to be humility, humility before the God you serve. Uh, and that's sadly lacking. And of course, Sally's a comic character. Uh, whack on the lunchbox brought him to my point of view. And it's always the philosopher Linus that lags behind in these conversations. In the next panel, you hear, you see Charlie Brown, and there's Snoopy typing away at his typewriter. I hear you're writing a book on theology. I hope you have a good title. Snoopy says, well, Snoopy says to himself, right? The difference between the pointed speaking comma at the end of the bubble and the, the bubbles themselves, which imply thought in the, in the strip, uh, Snoopy, says, Snoopy thinks to himself, I have the perfect title. Quote, has it ever occurred to you that you might be wrong? For Christians who start our lives in sin, for Christians whose whole, ex whole experience is mediated by our sinful choices, right? The idea that we could go through our lives and never be the slightest bit agitated by the fact that we could be wrong. We could be wrong about our dogma. We could be wrong about the makeup of w even our own Christianity uh, or our relationship to it or our relationship to others who, who are Christians. It's a great question to ask everybody, regardless of their faith perspective or regardless of their lack of a faith perspective. Uh, it's a question we're unwilling to ask uh, too often. Has it ever occurred to you that you might be wrong? I mean, being wrong and, and asking the question are, the, are two different things, but it's an important distinction, isn't it? Has it ever, for how many of us, regardless of our religion, and particularly for those of us who are Christian, for how many of us has it never occurred to us that we could be wrong about fundamental aspects of our own faith, let alone the faiths of others? And so you have the pragmatist and you have the evangelist. And uh, for Schultz, very often, the problem was never Christ. It's Christians. In the same way, uh, somebody once famously remarked that the problem with capitalism is capitalists. Uh, it's a great idea. Material capital is a great idea. It's brought greater wealth to more people than any other system of, go of economics. Uh, when it goes wrong, it goes wrong not because the problem is with capitalism. The problem is with the capitalist who gets greedy. Um, and so in the case here, uh, the problem is not Christians for Schultz, Christianity for Schultz. It can be Christians. You have this wonderful panel, uh, and I absolutely. Notice how when he wants to convey these gorgeous snowscapes, there's no discernible line. You don't have a horizon line. You don't have, uh, a, it's almost as if they're floating in air, which is a, a fantastic way to suggest that the snow is so deep and so thick and it's coming down so vociferously uh, that those boundaries have been obliterated. And there you have in their, their warm beaver-like caps, you have Shermie <coughs> and Charlie Brown walking down the street. And they're all bundled up, and poor Snoopy is there with only the fur God gave him, shivering, right? That, that, that agonizing look on Snoopy's face, uh, that big round muzzle of his, no smile, the mouth's obliterated, that big nose, those big doleful eyes and those sad brows, the ears tucked over in cold, and there he is shivering. Snoopy looks kind of cold, doesn't he, says Charlie Brown. I'll say he does, says Shermie. Maybe we better go over and comfort him. And they both surround the dog, right? And Shermie says, be of good cheer, Snoopy. Yes, be of good cheer, says Charlie Brown. And off they go. Wow, what a satire. Christ is constantly saying, be of good cheer to his disciples, right? You know me, you have me, Christ says. There is no reason ever again in the course of all human history for anybody to feel miserable. The end is won, death is defeated. Faith alone now, faith alone in conjunction uh, with your own attitudes and behaviors, faith alone can be enough. Uh, my sacrifice is enough. So when Christ said, be of good cheer, he always followed it up with a parable, with a miracle, with a healing, with a resurrection. So Christ's mercy, Christ's theology didn't stop with comforting words. It was always followed up by sacrifice. Here, Shermie and Charlie Brown, they get the first part right, but they don't get the second part right. They, they hit G, uh, uh, Snoopy with the, the platitude. Be of good cheer, Snoopy. Yes, be of good cheer. But they don't take off their coat. They don't leave their hat behind with him. They don't bring the pup with them into the house. And there he sits to shiver as they walk off. This is a certain kind of Christianity, right? A certain kind of, of, of thick-headedness. Uh, sinful unawareness, that platitudes 
are only useful when they're backed up with action, right? And so the faith and the act, and the whole debate about uh, faith and good works, it's absolutely meaningless for us here in this context uh, because Schultz rejected that, right? For Schultz, uh, to be a Christian and to act like a Christian had to be the same thing. To believe what a Christian believed and to try to live the life of a Christian, they had to go together. You couldn't separate them. And in the second ca comic strip, you see exactly the opposite. So Snoopy is not dejected. Snoopy is not cold. He's ecstatic. This is the wave of joy I mentioned to you, that uh, the, the Peanuts comic strip, it encapsulates horrifying, horrifying despair and loneliness and isolation and coldness and deals <clears throat> with the savagery of human beings to each other and to animals like Snoopy. <clears throat> but in the second comic strip, you have an exultant Snoopy dancing, his ears in a horseshoe of joy, big smile on his face, that muzzle of his no longer contracted into a round punched in the face look, but expanded a pure smile that seems to run the whole length of his elongated face, those feet going a mile a minute, almost literally walking on the air as the, the, the lines indicating his distance from the ground and his shadow, as if he is floating on air and the fuss budget of the comic strip, that punch-in-the-face realist, Lucy, uh, the most vicious character in many ways in the whole strip, uh, despite her vulnerability. She starts screaming things at Snoopy, floods, fire, and famine, doom, defeat, and despair, and nothing dampens the spirit of that dancing dog. I guess, she says, it's no use, Sigh. Nothing seems to disturb him. And that's a big bother for her, right? It's a bother for her because in her materialist understanding of the universe, right, uh, there's too many, there's too much miserable stuff in the world to be happy. Nobody should ever be that happy and carefree. It's an affront to the realities of life to be that happy and carefree. How dare this beagle not recognize the suffering in the world and most importantly, the suffering in Lucy's own little corner of it the misery, uh, the fussiness, uh, all of the selfishness that causes her despair. And so she can't disturb him, right? And it bothers her. There are really people like this, right? Who are, I call them atheists many, most of the time, right? The ones who can't stand to see a nativity scene on, during Christmas week, who are so bothered by the phrase Merry Christmas that they get the ACLU involved, if you even dare utter it, even at the holiday time. Uh, this kind of worldliness, world, uh, the, the, the spiritual joy, the joy of I mean, if you, if you combine the two comic strips, yes, be of good cheer, right? That is Christ's injunction, and it perfectly fits Snoopy in the second panel. doesn't fit him in the first one, right? And so in the second panel, S Lucy wants to steal his joy. In the first panel, they have nothing but words for him. And so Schultz is constantly going back and forth trying to expose these dichotomies in the human experience. Faith and doubt, absolutely critical. Uh, you look at the next comic strip, Another beautiful rainscape, another moment when they're leaving the stoop, right? The, I love the wonderfully wrought iron of that rail. Just look at the way uh, the, the posts that support the handrail. Uh, wonderfully wrought, just a couple of simple lines, a uh, little dark sketching on the stairs, almost throws it into relief. And then you get that, that pale white background with the, the driving rain, uh, and then they're in their caps and they're off again. And Charlie Brown says, the rain falls on the just and the unjust, one pause for the third frame, right? Where Linus looks out of the panel at you, the audience. Charlie Brown keeps his head down, his hands in his rain slicker. But with that wonderful Gilligan's Island rain hat on, Linus looks out at you, puzzled, turns back to his friend, and in the payoff panel, he says, that's a good system. It's wonderful. How existential is that? The rain falls on the just and the unjust in this fallen world, that you cannot tell materially, right, where justice comes from, that the elements, the natural world in which we find ourselves, it is indiscriminately uninterested in your virtue or your vice. Uh, nature doesn't play favorites. Things like cancer and floods and famines and tsunamis and uh, none of these things are, are determined by your virtue and worth. Uh, that nature treats everybody the same. That's both a comfort to Linus in the sense, right, that there is equity in the natural world, but it's also a warning, right, uh, that justice, if it's going to be found, has to be found outside of nature, outside of material reality, outside of reason, outside of human understanding. Uh, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful articulation. And I mean, you've got what? 
maybe 10 words in the entire panel uh, to convey this really deep sense of these issues. In fact, I think it's the simplicity, the fewer words you can use to express these sentiments, the more powerful those sentiments resonate with us. And in the next one, another four panel strip, and you've got Charlie Brown now hectoring Linus. There he is from behind. You've got Linus's blanket, his, his security blanket dragging on the ground. And Charlie Brown says, so you think the world is getting better? Well, if you've got so much confidence in the world's getting better, how come you hang on to that blanket? And that beautiful moment where Linus, right, with that pretty round face, expressive eyes, looks down at his blanket in his hands, right? I'm a cradling it like Mar the, the Virgin Mary cradles Christ in, the, in, in Da Vinci's famous Michelangelo's famous Pieta, right? That great statue of, of Jesus, the dead Jesus in the, in the lap of M Mother Mary, cradling that blanket, that security blanket the same way, puts his thumb in the mouth, eyes get big, touche, right? You got me. Uh, it's a remarkable thing that the same Linus who used his um, blanket as a security. Uh, tremendous, despite all of his philosophy, his spirituality, Linus is the character more than anybody, anyone that quotes the Bible again and again and again in the Peanuts cartoons. And yet for all of that, be of good cheer, do not fear, right? Uh, the, the rain falls on the just and the unjust. You still have this crippling anxiety that comes from being human, that all Linus's faith is indeed mediated by his humanity. And that this doubt, this ability, you, again, Dostoevsky, the great Christian writer, made the argument that there is no faith without doubt. That doubt is the natural precursor of faith. And the minute you have faith without doubt is the minute that your faith becomes watered down. And yet Schultz never lets you get there with a character like Linus. Touche, right? If you move to the next one, the light in the world, right? The light and the world, the light of the world. Some of my favorite, all-time favorite Peanuts comic strips are the ones done at night uh, because Schultz does a wonderful job of capturing the mystery, the, the hush of darkness. Uh, in fact, some of the most religious or spiritual of the panels are the ones done at night uh, precisely because he does such a good job of capturing that ethos. And there you have a dark night. And the way that candle, that one little candle, blazes in its little orbit, right? It, doesn't, it does nothing to dispel the huge, vast darkness of the cosmos behind them. But it does cast light on his face, and it does cast light in the direction of Charlie Brown. And Charlie Brown says, what's this? And Linus says, I have heard that it is better to light a single candle than to curse the darkness. That's true, Charlie Brown says, although there are, will always be those who disagree with you. And in the fourth payoff panel, there's Lucy with her big mouth, bigly opened, bigly exclaiming, you stupid darkness, right? So Lucy takes the time to curse the dark, right? And so you see uh, the light in the world here. Uh, you have the materialist and you have the believer. And, and poor Charlie Brown is the everyman stuck in the middle of those two, constantly in the this, in this strip. Charlie Brown is stuck between the materialist Lucy and the idealist Linus. Uh, he is the everyman. He's us. Uh, we suffer. We don't understand it. We oftentimes find ourselves in ridiculous situations. We make fools of ourselves. We humiliate ourselves. Uh, and you've got the believer, the, ang the anxious believer, and the uh, oblivious non-believer as wonderful foils for Charlie Brown in the image. And one of my, uh, one of the, the neat ones here, the light, we looked at the, if you look at the previous one, it was the light in the world, and we, we carry that forward here. There's Lucy in one of her fuss budget crab moments, right? Leaning on a beautifully well-drawn ottoman, right? The weight of Lucy in her dress uh, pushes down on the left side of the ottoman, and she says, phooey. And Linus says, what's the matter? My life is a drag. I'm completely fed up. I've never felt so low in my life. Linus says, when you're in a mood like this, you should try to think of things you have to be thankful for. In other words, count your blessings. Ha! That's a good one. I can count my blessings on one finger. I've never had anything and I will never have anything. I don't get half the breaks that other people do. Nothing ever goes right for me. And you talk about counting blessings. You talk about being thankful. What do I have to be thankful for? Linus's response. Well, for one thing, you have a little brother who loves you. And the money right there is just, the, it's not the final panel, it's the way they look at each other. The way Linus looks at his sister, expecting to be socked in the jaw, because that's usually what she does. And that, that epiphany, that's what we call an epiphany, right? Lucy has an epiphany that his scriptural, biblical, Christian injunctions to her 
have actually silenced her. And in the final panel, she throws herself on his shoulders and she cries. And he says, every now and then, I say the right thing. Light in the world. And here you have it again. The biblical emphasis of our little Linus, our philosopher, our little theologian. He's walking to school for show and tell, and he's carrying a yoke, an actual yoke that would be worn by a cow or an ox. Good morning, Charlie Brown. Good morning. Do you mind if I ask you a question? What in the world is that? Linus says, this is a yoke. I'm going to use it for a special school report. I'm going to tell how the yoke is a symbol of subjection of one individual to another, as Esau to Jacob, Genesis 2740. Then I'll tell how the yoke was sometimes placed literally on the neck of a person reduced to submission. My reference then will be Jeremiah 2810. Then I'll tell of the yoke placed on Israel by Solomon and Rehoboam, 1 Kings 12, 9, and wind up talking about the yoke of sin suggested in Lamentations, 1, 1, 4, and the easy yoke of Matthew eleven twenty nine. I think that will cover it pretty well. And then that pause, Charlie Brown looking just astonished at the erudition, at the uh, incredibly... Um, thorough exposition of yokes in scripture. And he turns to Linus, who's already walked out of the, the image, going on his merry way as if that's Linus's life. And he shouts at him, what about the yoke of inferiority you have given to me? Right? That's it. Those who have the truth oftentimes seem out of it. It seem like they are oblivious. Those who have the truth uh, oftentimes make those who don't feel bad, uh, not intentionally very often, but it happens, right? That to be happy, to be in the moment, to be secure in what you believe, boy, does that make materialists really unhappy. And so uh, if you look at my commentary, then on the left of the, the, you, these two great quotes, one from Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 and 30, Jesus said, for my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. If you wear my yoke, if you submit to me, your burden will be light. And then from Galatians 5, 1, St. Paul, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. To be yoked to the world is to carry a burden. To be yoked to Christ is to be liberated. My will, my sacrifice. My love will set you free. My truth will set you free. Lay the burdens on me, Christ says. Two different scriptural interpretations that make exactly the same point. You can be freed by yoke and service to Christ. You can, be, you can have all the world and everything in it and still be bound uh, as a slave in bondage to materialism. One of my favorite verses from the Gospels, Matthew 6, chapter 21. Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. For where your treasure is, Christ says, there will your heart be also. Uh, where you place your faith is where you will go, you'll follow. So if your faith is in the things of the world, riches and money, your heart will be a worldly heart. If your faith is in God, then your faith will be otherwise. And you have this wonderfully color Sunday comic where they're sitting on a beautiful bench in the middle. You can see how high the snow rises, almost to the bottom of the bench itself. The beautiful way that he suggests snow on the trees with just a few dabs of white ink, right? And that vast, beautiful Minneapolis, that Minnesota open countryside. Linus says, let's see. Luke, the second chapter, the eighth verse. Quote, Linus says, is their walk. And in that region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were filled with fear. And the angel said to them, Be not afraid, for behold, I bring you great good news of a great joy which will come to all people. For to you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, it is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly... There was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among men with whom he is pleased. And I, I love it. After all of that, that beautiful, simple recitation of the fundamental nature of the Gospels, he sighs, right? What a moving moment. He turns to Charlie Brown and says, Like I've said before, that's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. You're right, says Charlie Brown. The response from Linus, so who needs Santa Claus? The same Linus who here recognizes that 
the, the gift giver, Santa Claus, old Saint Nick, is completely unnecessary because all the most meaningful gifts were already given by the Savior. He's the same Linus who clings to his blanket, the same Linus, by the way, who puts his faith in the great pumpkin uh, throughout all those wonderful strips, which we will see when we get to Linus's character, uh, uh, putting faith in that misplaced faith. So uh, the up and down, the doubt that comes with the belief, and we'll wind up this opening today. Uh, you, so not only did Schultz take the trouble to actually write out the gospel message of the nativity, right? The important message of the nativity in the opening chapters of the Gospel of Luke in the famous Charlie Brown Christmas, which debate, debate, uh, debuted in December 9th, 1965, well over 50 years ago, sponsored by the Coca-Cola Company. There were no child's voices. This was an absolute revolution. Uh, the studio, the executives, were really, and his producers, were harping on Schultz to cast adults to do the voices of children. It was absolutely Schultz's point, no, 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 no. They must be little kids' voices suggesting sorrow and elation and despair. And so he won that one, Schultz. Not adult actors. There was no laugh track to the whole thing. That was also a no-no. You think about all the, sit the six sitcoms of the 1960s. They all had that really annoying, invasive laugh track. No, Schultz said, we've got to get rid of that. The encounter with the emotions has to be sincere. Unlike the kind of goofy kids music that usually accompanied cartoons back then, Schultz had the very, very hip soundtrack by Vince Guaraldi, right, that became a multi, 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 multi-million seller down through the years. Really serious, advanced jazz jazz piano and, and horns and, in, and jazz drumming, all set to these little kids interacting in their own little town. Do you know, uh, somebody did an actual, a university professor did an actual survey of this. Less than 9%, nine, of all 60s era Christmas specials actually referenced the religious aspects of the Christmas story. So in the 1960s, back before belief had been completely stripped from the public schools, before uh, the expression of Christianity in the public square was condemned, back when most of America considered themselves ad active Christians, and Christianity was the driving force in American public life, even then, only 9% of, the, of the, the time devoted to 60s Christmas, Christmas specials had anything to do with the Christian aspects of Christmas. It was reindeers, it was Rudolph, it was all that other frosty, the snowman, but it wasn't Christ. The, the executives, his own producers, uh, Melendez and Mendelssohn came down hard on him. You can't have Linus read the Gospels. You can't have actual biblical quotes in this thing. You can't do it. Uh, and his producers, the, the Coca-Cola Cola company, the studio executives all told him, you can't put that in. We can't let you put that in. It's going to offend people. It's going to turn people off. Schultz's response to that was, if we don't do it, who will? If we as Christians don't do it, don't make the season about Christ, then who's going to do it? Boy, and since this special, if 9% of the 60s specials talked about religion, what percentage of the modern ones do you think do? None of them do. Not one of them have much to say about the And that's what happens. If we as Christians don't stand up for what we believe in, then what we believe in becomes marginalized and then persecuted. If we don't put it in, Schultz said, who will? And he was right. It won an immediate, immediately won an Emmy Award, a Peabody Award. It's been played every year since to great acclaim. Uh, the DV, people can't get enough of it, right? It is a hallmark, a staple of the Christian season. And so Schultz was actually absolutely right. Let's take a look, though, at that moving Here's moment. We'll end, with, so we'll end with this. Isn't there anyone who knows what Christmas is all about? Sure, Charlie Brown. I can tell you what Christmas is all about. Lights, please. And there were in the same country shepherds, abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men.
That's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. Man, what a wonderful moment. I mean, to me, that is the essence of the Christian themes, the, the Christianity that pervades the entire comic strip. Do you notice how when it started that clip, you were way in the back of the theater? This is a public school theater. This is a theater at their local public school. You notice up on the stage an American flag, as if that could be the case anymore. And at this flag, at, at this public school, they are putting on a Christian Christmas play. All the other characters you may remember, they're inventing dances, they're bringing in the, Lucy wants to be the Christmas queen. They're completely little kids already have learned that they were secularizing the Christian holiday, so much so that it made Charlie Brown eminently depressed. It's about plastic trees and about Christmas queens and about pageants, but it's not about Jesus. And that moment when Linus stands up on that stage and from way in the back of the theater, the camera zooms in on Linus, right? Just illuminated by a single spotlight. And he recites those moving words, those eternal words, coming out of the mouth of a, of a, of a eight-year-old boy, a seven-year-old boy, spoken by a seven-year-old boy with a little bit of a lisp too, right? A little bit of a speech impediment, right? That, that's the joy, that's the thing about Christ's message. It isn't just available to the wise men. Of all the gods that ever came to, that ever came to earth, of all the gods that men and women have ever worshiped, there's never been one so accessible to the uneducated, so uneducated to the miserable, so uh, uh, available to the suffering, so available to the little kid, to the little child, right? Uh, this message is universal that way. And when he gives that, you have, the focus comes just on his little face, and he reads that speech impediment at all. He's no longer shy. He's no longer anxious. He no longer needs that security blanket, right? He has, in that moment, he has become the living embodiment of the spirit of Christmas. And so uh, as we move forward in the next three segments, we're going to talk about Charlie Brown in the next one, Linus and Lucy in the, the third one, and we're going to close with Snoopy. So we're going to look at all of these themes, and we're going to make them particular. Uh, from one episode to the next, thanks for being here. Can't wait to see you next time.